The title of the book, One of a Kind, and the author is Tony Moore, and Tony joins us on air. Hello, Tony. Hi, Steve. Great to have you with us. This is an incredible true life story. It's your story, and it's all about, as you write, about making it through from a very humble childhood life in England, going through uh, orphanages, foster homes, and of course, the sad loss, which is just incredible. I don't think many of us can relate to this, but the sad loss of two sets of parents at a young age. But on the other end, you became a very successful entrepreneur. So you weren't of the mindset to say, I can't do it. I've had all these problems. What in the world does, does anyone expect? You hear that from a lot of people, though, don't you? Yes, you do. And, uh, and it's sadly become a norm for many people to look at a reason not to bother to try and and sadly, when they do that, it becomes a crutch for not succeeding in the rest of their lives. And I don't believe any of us were put here to just not bother. I think we were all put here to try and make a difference in whatever way we can. And so my story is really, you know, how I managed to do that with being dealt the hand that I was dealt with. Right. And it's an emotional roller coaster, uh, of course. There's always the opportunity there to decide what you're, how you're going to handle it, I guess, even at a very young age. And can you take us back? Can you remember? Let's see, how old were you when, when you had to be put into a boarding school or a foster home? How old? It was, well, it was uh, about 18 months, actually, that I was removed from my mother. Wow. She had tuberculosis. And at that time, we were, you know, England was going through a transition into trying to wipe out disease and TB hadn't yet been eradicated. So she was, she had tuberculosis when I was born and I was born what's called a TB contact, which meant I had a huge scar on my lungs and I was about 13. So the, the, the London County Council at that time had to take me away from her and put me in into care, which was a children's home in Lowestoft. And that was really so that I could recuperate away from my mother um, and I do recall seeing her a couple of times when I went to see her in Acton in London and uh, once when she came to see me. And they were the only really the two times that I recall ever seeing her. And the last time I saw her, uh, I couldn't even get close to her. That was when I was about uh, four and uh, she was able to come and see me. She could only see me through the window, the bay window at the back of my aunt's huge home. And so the only way that we could communicate was that I was able to put my hand on the glass window and she did the same. And so she spoke to me, you know, just smiled at me through the window. And sadly, she died 10 days later. So it was her last trip to see me. And, and that was one of the early stories in, in my book. So how old were you when she died? Uh, four years old then. What kind of impact? What do you what do you remember? I mean, what were you thinking? Can you take us back at all? Well, as luck would have it, or by divine intervention, where I was at my aunt's house, I was just so busy. There were 25, 30 other children, all aged from a year old to like seven or eight years old. And my aunt had, had turned her house over to becoming a nursery for young children that for one reason or another couldn't stay at home. Um, either they were, they were children of, of diplomats and their diplomatic parents traveled and they couldn't take the children with them. Uh, or like me, you know, they couldn't live at home for reasons of health. But we were all there and so that became my home. And you've got to realize that at, at 18 months old or a year old, what you experience from that to seven, I mean, that's really your home. So I was just too busy living life to, and, and my mother played a very small role in my life. I knew who she was because my aunt constantly told me that your mother's getting better or you know she's doing worse and so it was just somebody that was referenced in daily conversation to me but never having seen her really it didn't mean that much to me except that she was a person called my mother uh, my aunt and all the others there were my family so that really overtook everything in my life so when i was told that she had died i do remember that very very clearly i was uh, lying on the floor next to a huge dollhouse and uh, painting and uh, my aunt came and said tony i've got some very sad news for you your mother's uh, sadly passed away she's gone to the fairies and i i didn't know what i was saying at the time and i said well then i think that's for the better don't you she's probably in a better place and and i carried on painting uh, and so mm -hmm. it didn't 
didn't really hit me till mm-hmm. many, many years later that that was it for me. I was then on my own. And then you were fostered out to a couple, but the unexpected happened there too. Yeah, yes. That, and, and they were they were truly wonderful people. And uh, as I explained in my book, it was a normal life for me now, you know. Um, I was part of a family and I'd been through a couple of children's homes and a couple of disastrous places to live before I got there. And uh, they picked me up out of a, an orphanage in, in uh, Ealing in West London and uh, took me home. And then after you know, a period of six months, we, we decided that it would be great for me to live there with them. Sadly, one afternoon, my mother, my stepmother, I called her mum. We were coming back from um, you know, going to a, a sports club that we used to go to a couple of times a month. And she sat down on a wall feeling giddy at the end of our road and just died there and then. She had a massive aneurysm in her brain. And uh, we walked on home not knowing that she had died right there on the, on, the, on the pavement. And so we were left really with a single parent dad. And sadly, he died with, um, or three years after that, with pneumonial bronchitis. And so then once again, you know, I'm left on my own. Uh, and that was pretty serious then because I was now older. But each time these bad things happened, you know, I, I just had to move on. I couldn't dwell on it. You know, I just had to keep moving on, really, to survive. And back in those days, there were apprenticeships. Tell us about what you did. Well, they, their, remedy, their remedy for me was to uh, move me to boarding school, which, whether I wanted to or not, that was where I was going. And that was hilarious. I mean, a lot of, a lot of fun things happened there. You either get, get on, and it's a little bit at that point, like an Oliver Twist, you know, you're thrown into boarding school and you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, but then I decided that um, I liked engineering. And so I got a, an engineering apprenticeship, which put me through college. Um, and it would, it would gave, give me a degree in engineering. But the money was so small. Um, you know, the, the education was free for me. So I was a month at college and two months at work. And then that was a five-year apprenticeship. But the money was so small that I had to do something to make up, you know, make up my wages. So I learned to sing and play the guitar, and we ended up playing all over London, all over the south of England. We we backed some pretty big bands, and um, my two partners that I sang with, one of them is now, believe it or not, um, Vice Admiral of the Royal Navy, and he was knighted by the Queen, Sir Adrian John, and uh, he was in the band with us. And he's now governor of Gibraltar, so you meet some fascinating people along the way. But we did play, and that supplemented my income. So I got through college just fine. And then a lot of doors just opened. Uh, You had, uh, obviously, skills, and you were smart. Uh, You say 137 IQ, that that, uh, served you well. Yes, it did. And I don't know if any of the listeners will understand what an IQ really is. All it means is that you retain information and you can use that information later on in the correct way. It just means that you, you can assimilate a lot, of, a lot of things in your experiences and you, you retain that knowledge. But it meant that um, I could see things that the people in the companies couldn't see. After I finished my apprenticeship, I joined a company called Alpha Laval, an absolutely fantastic Fortune 300 company. And I was in the spares department and I thought, you know, why are we doing all this? Why are we waiting till the phone rings and then we have to deal with the problem? They want urgent parts. They want urgent service. Everything was a breakdown. So I started to visit the customers and one thing led to another. And I started being able to offer them preventive maintenance, which had never been done at that time in the company. It just took off. And um, so it gave me a chance to work with just about every single industry that there was. And it became such a fantastic product for the company that they asked me if I would like to install it in Europe. And I said, well, yeah. So we made sure it was right in the UK. And then I started developing it into France, Germany, Holland, Norway, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, all of the European countries, including Belgium. It took off there as well. And what I had done caught the eyes of the French nuclear power group, EDF. And so I I set up a maintenance system for them, which really saved the, the French power generation, although they don't know it. It just happened as many things just happened without you realizing what you're doing at the time, the impact. But it meant that they could have continuous production while we were going through some very serious maintenance issues with the, all the heat exchange that they had for cooling the nuclear reactor, cooling the pond water, the, uh, the auxiliary cooling systems and all of that. 
so it, it took off in a bigger way. And then the company moved me to Brussels to head up the global marketing operation. And then I was asked to set it up into 30 countries. So, you know, in the book, I describe how that cookie cutter process worked in, in 30 countries. So I traveled all over the world with this. You have a very basic view of your life. You just believe that we're all given divine tools, skills that will help us throughout our lives. And, you know, some people may uh, mock a belief in a higher power, but uh, you truly believe that. Yes, for, for, for very profound reasons. We can go on saying that life is random. It's just a bunch of chemicals. And I think one of the one of the stories that I talk about is my uncle, who was actually the one of the Queen's veterinary surgeons. He ran the Royal Veterinary College for many years as president, and his name is Dr. John Bleeby. And one day he said to me, "You know, Tony, when you get to when you get to our age, you know, our experience, you realise that it's just a bunch of chemicals and that God doesn't really exist." And I, I remember saying to him without thinking, well, God is the stuff that you can't measure. It's the stuff that holds everything together. When you can measure that, maybe then you can start to understand who, who God is. But when I talk about divine gifts, I mean, people say, you know, he or she was a natural. Well, she was always going to be a nurse. She was always a caring person. He was always going to be a doctor or he was always interested in mechanical things. And what I'm saying in the book is that we're all given these divine talents. They're talents that we're born with. And it doesn't matter whether you choose to use them or not. That's your choice. We've been given freedom of choice. But when you do use them, life takes on a very different aspect for you. Life becomes relatively easier. You start doing what you were you know, made to do, and it's like nothing happens. Uh, very often, you know, with a computer system, when it's working perfectly well, it's like nothing's there. It's when it doesn't work, that it suddenly becomes highly visible. And that's what it is with people. When they start to try to do things that they're really not cut out to do, they start having problems. So I learned at an earlier age that, you know, hey, I've been given these tools. I, I seem to have a gift for being an entrepreneur. And so I just found ways of seeing things differently within the companies that I worked for. And it became very successful for me. And to add to that, uh, you talk about 1,500 retirees were asked, if you could change anything in your life, what would you and what would it be? Tell us about what they said and your view of it. Right at the end, uh, in, in the summary of the book, there, were, there was a survey done with 1,500 retirees. And one of the questions they were asked was, you know, if you could change anything in your life, would you change anything and what would it be? And nearly all of them said, I wish I had taken more risks. And I thought to myself how sad that would be when so many people, people that you've talked to, people that I've talked to, they say, I think I'll do that when I retire. And they leave it all until they retire, which at that point is too late. You can't suddenly do all the things that you want to do, except maybe travel if you're, if you're lucky enough. But it's too late at that point. So I've said that the same as them, it would be a pity to have to get to that point of your life and realize that you wish you had taken more chances, at least some risk. And if they don't work out, okay, close the door on the bad things and, and move on and try something different. But there's nothing to stop any of us from realizing, you know, our life stream. Nothing. It's only us. And I said, you know, if it doesn't work, then try something else. My book has actually motivated a lot of people who have written to me and said, wow, I, I now realize that I have to do this myself. And, and they're starting to try to do things, you know, that they may not have done otherwise, which is great. Well, that's a real uh, tribute to your story, your example. And again, it's story of Tony Moore. It's his, his life story, one of a kind, his memoirs. Tony, tell us how to get your book. Um, the book is available at Amazon.com if you look for One of a Kind by Tony Moore. And there are also several reader reviews there, which are fun to read. Um, and I also have a Facebook page, One of a Kind by Tony Moore. And on there, there's a lot more information. Uh, there's a couple of interviews that I did for Fox News and for NBC recently. And there's a book review which went out to 52 uh, radio stations around England. Uh, which was done in February. So there's quite a lot of information about the book. Uh, and there's some summaries as well there, which are quite fun to read. So that, that's where you can get it from, Amazon.com. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for being with us. Thank you very much. It's good to talk to you.